So, hello everybody, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Thomas, as I said, and today I want to tell you a little bit about how you can secure your microservices with Keycloak. Uh, before we start, maybe a quick question. Who of you is already using Keycloak in a project at some point? Okay, just a few hands go up. We will see whether we can change that in a bit. Um, first, a few words about me. Uh, I work for Codecentric, where I help customers implement their identity and access management infrastructures with Keycloak and other tools. And in my not-so-distant past, I worked at Pivotal in the Spring Data team and helped building many of the Spring Data libraries that some of you might use and love. Um, besides that, I'm a huge fan of open source. I love working with and on open source projects. And as uh, was said already, um, I'm also an organizer of various community meetups, for instance, the Java user group Saarland, uh, which uh, is hosted in Saarbrücken, a city where I live. So whenever you uh, are in Saarland or around and want to learn something about Java, then check out our meetups and uh, come by. You're very welcome. So, and why can I tell you a little bit about Keycloak? Well, I've been a Keycloak contributor for over three years now. I contributed various uh, CVE fixes, patches, new features, documentation, and a lot of examples. And uh, uh, based on that experience, I want to share a little bit from the lessons learned I learned myself over the last few years. So uh, we have a lot of co to cover. Therefore, we will go on a little journey that will first take us to Keycloak, so that we learn a little bit about the project itself. Then we will learn how single sign-on works with Keycloak and what possibilities exist there. Um, after that, we will learn how we can secure our applications with Keycloak. And finally, we will, we will conclude with some experience and examples how Keycloak can be used in practice in the field, so to speak. So, <clears throat> having said that, let's start with what Keycloak is. If you look at the website, you would see this. Uh, Keycloak describes itself as an open source identity and access management solution for modern applications and services. That's totally true, but keep in mind, you can also use that with existing and traditionally engineered applications, yeah, you know? Just to, to, to have that in mind. Uh, website is uh, keycloak.org, and um, you will see that Keycloak provides a lot of features out of the box, as I will show you in the next few minutes. Wait, so what is actually Keycloak? Well, if you download the Keycloak project itself, you get basically a Java-based authentication authorization server. Um, and uh, the project, uh, the Keycloak project itself, started around 2013, so it's been around for quite a while now, and it got really popular around 2015. And nowadays, a lot of companies, especially in Germany and countries around that, uh, use Keycloak in their day-to-day -day projects for their core infrastructure, uh, identity and access management infrastructure, if they don't want to do cloud. Um, so, uh, Keycloak itself, as I said, is open source, Apache licensed, and mainly developed, developed by the Red Hat developers, but uh, there's a huge community around that who contributes new features, patches, and so forth. Um, keep in mind, um, the latest stable version is Keycloak 50 uh, and came out just a few weeks ago and but you can expect that you see a new version around every six weeks or so right so they have a pretty uh, fast paced de de uh, development model there so at least you can get a new version in short intervals um, there's a community version of Keycloak which is completely free um, um, but if you need some more uh, additional support, there's also a commercial version available from Red Hat, which is called Red Hat SSO, right? Which is effectively a Keycloak like in the community version, but with some patch management and some additional support. Yeah, and as I said, Keycloak has a vital community around the project. There are many, many, many contributors and a lot of forks that contribute that played, tried out new things and contributed them back to the project. And from experience, I can tell you that the project is uh, very robust in practice once you got, get it running and uh, set it up properly. And it comes with great documentation and provides you with many, many examples that makes it easy to get started and to integrate your own applications with Keycloak. Well, what are the features the Keycloak provides? Well, one of the most important features, of course, the support for single sign-on. Right? 
And this is provided by leveraging a set of standardized protocols like OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, and SAML, as you have heard uh, in previous conference talks already, right? Uh, Keyclock also provides a flexible authentication and authorization model uh, that can be um, customized to your needs. And of course, if you have some additional um, um, requirements, you can always uh, provide your own custom uh, authentication mechanisms and logic there. Um, out of the box, it already supports uh, multi-factor authentication, so you can use uh, some tools like Google Authenticator and similar things uh, to uh, improve the security of your user accounts. And um, yeah, it also provides out-of-the-box support to connect with existing identity providers like Google, Facebook, Twitter, but also um, identity providers like Out0 or um, Azure Active Directory and the like. Um, yeah, it gives you also a centralized user management with a basic user management UI that enables your administrator to yeah, manage your users via a nice web user interface, um, as we will see in a bit. Um, yeah. But most of the time, you, when you use, want to use something like Keycloak, you probably already have uh, an existing user directory of some sort, like an Active, uh, Active Directory or an LDAP or something like that. And uh, Keycloak also supports that uh, as well. You can connect to existing user stores to integrate your uh, existing user base into Keycloak and uh, immediately be able to yeah, secure your applications with the existing users that you already have. Um, besides that, uh, Keycloak uh, provides many customization options, being it, it uh, look and feel, or uh, internationalization options, or uh, one of the various settings. And if this is not enough, you can uh, leverage the rich extension model that Keycloak provides to provide your own logic to Keycloak, be it uh, with authentication or authorization mechanisms, or just uh, custom, uh, yeah, something, right? Event listeners and the like, you name it. And you will see that Keycloak is quite easy to set up um, when you want to get started and also easy to integrate into existing applications. There are many, many possibilities there to uh, integrate Keycloak, but we will see uh, a few of them in the next few slides. Before we dive too deep into the Keycloak uh, examples, we have to uh, get familiar with some of the main concepts first. And the most important concept uh, in Keycloak is the so-called realm, which forms some kind of central structuring element, uh, which is also the base for multi-tenancy, right? In a realm, uh, a realm is more or less some kind of a container where you store, have your user uh, stored, where you have the, a list of your clients or your applications that you want to secure with Keycloak, and you have uh, your uh, uh, authorization structures like roles, groups, and permissions, and so forth stored under one umbrella. You can also configure various settings, for instance, uh, that affect the user interface or the look and feel, and similar things. Besides that, Keycloak also provides uh, ways to manage uh, Keys because uh, Keycloak uses uh, public key cryptography um, for assigning um, tokens, as we will learn in a bit, and uh, you can also have key rotation there and so forth. It's provided out of the box. Um, what Keycloak also provides is uh, support for various identity providers. I just named a few. One of the social, some of the social ones are listed here, but there are, there are many, many more. But uh, you can also connect with uh, some. Uh, other uh, identity providers that just have to provide you with uh, some of those uh, standard uh, uh, authentication protocols like SAML or OpenID Connect, right? Um, so if you use identity prov an identity provider, you can basically log in with an external service and then get the authentication information sent back to Keycloak and Keycloak will trust that information. On the other hand, there's user federation, which enables you to use the login pages that you will see that Keycloak provides with the user data credentials that are provided by your own user stores. So you log into Keycloak with your data, so to speak. That are the two ways you can integrate users. Um, yeah, so enough said. Let's go to a quick tour around the admin console. Here, this is the basic login page that Keycloak provides. I mean, nothing fancy, right? Username, password, and so forth. You can log in. And now you see a login page. Uh, now you see the admin console. And here you see that we are in the realm called Acme, right? 
And this Equity Realm uh, offers us new, now some possibilities to customize the RAM a bit. We can change the name and various look and feel aspects, as I will demonstrate now. For instance, if I open up this new, this new uh, incognito window here, you see again the login page, right? But that's often not enough. I mean, if you have had implemented a login functionality in your applications before, you know, okay, that's a good start, but you, usually you need some more stuff to, to this, right? So, um, yeah, um, who of you had some, at some point in your life had to implement a login screen like that, or a login authentication mechanism? Okay, some hands go up, I know. Um, everyone has done it. Um, who of you liked the experience? Okay, no hands go up. Oh, one liked it. Okay, <laughs> you used something else, like out zero or something like that. The first time. Yeah, yeah, the first time was fun, right? But the uh, hundredth time or so, it's not so fun anymore. So now imagine that we get a requirement that say we want to have a support for remember me, um, forgot password, and by the way, we would also to be able to register users, right? In Kicklock, it's just a matter of a few clicks. I just enable user registration. I just say forgot password and remember me click save, and then reload, and boom, I have that functionality out of the box, right? And of course, um, you can uh, also customize the look and feel for how it looks like. For instance, um, this theme is maybe not a good representation of our company, but we could uh, upload a theme to Keycloak and say, okay, we want to use a different look and feel here, and I click reload, and boom, now our login page looks like this, right? You can add your logo, logo uh, your colors, and the like, you, you see. Um, let's step back. And yeah, that's basically it. You can customize many, many more things around the realm itself, but m the most important thing are probably, besides your users, the applications you want to protect, right? And applications in Kicklook are, so, are called clients uh, in the OAuth, or off speech, and uh, here I have an example application where you see that f in order to register an application, you would basically define a, a client ID, or oh, let me use a different example, wait a second, you would basically define a, a, a unique client ID, you define the authentication protocol that you want to use, for instance, OpenID Connect or SAML, and then you would configure the interaction model or the protocol model that you want to drive. Um, then you configure a set of URLs that are required for this integration, and um, then you can also uh, uh, access some credential information that you need maybe to, to configure your application, because this is the representation of your application on the Keycloak side, but you need to have some configuration on your application side as well. Um, then you can configure some uh, application-specific roles, um, and the nice feature with this role system in Kicklook is that roles can be nested. So you can have hierarchical role structures um, that, for instance, an, an admin role can also include a user role out of the box. Right? And besides those application-specific roles, you can also have some global roles that uh, um, that can um, contain multiple application roles. For instance, this user role here could uh, contain a user role for other applications, like uh, this, and so forth, so that with just one user role assignment, you can assign multiple roles at once. Yeah, and what's next? Um, yeah, I said, Kicklook provides this identity provider support and has a wide variety of social identity provider configurations built in out of the box so that you only need to provide things like client ID, secret, and, and so forth, and then you can immediately start. So for instance, if I enable here the Google Authenticator, which I populated with some dummy values, and I click reload on the login screen, I get here a link log to for logging in with Google, right? And uh, of course, you can uh, add your custom identity providers here as well. Okay, let's disable this again. I think the mic is that. Okay, I hope you can hear me still. Um, besides that, if you want to have um, user federation, you can also uh, say, okay, I want to connect to my existing user store, like LDAP, for instance, and they select, okay, I have an a active directory here, and I pop provide my connections to the user store, and boom, I can then use my Active Directory credentials to log in. Yeah. Uh, you can also customize the authentication mechanisms that Keycloak provides uh, in great detail. And 
of course, the most important thing, or one of the important things, are your users. And uh, here is the small user management uh, capabilities that Keycloak provides, uh, where you can effectively edit some settings around the user, can configure some attributes here and there, uh, manage users' credentials, and of course, assign, manage the role and group mapping. Right? Just that you see what you can do. And there are a lot of more things that you can do here. But let's go back to the slides. So, uh, that was basically the admin console that you see. Uh, the admin console is just an uh, Angular JS app, um, but I want to briefly talk about the technology that lies behind Keycloak, and I don't want to go, to go over every detail here, but the thing is, if you are a Java developer, uh, you are probably familiar with that st stuff, and uh, to, to, to summarize it, what Keycloak effectively is, is just a, um, a Jux AS application, uh, that runs on Wildfly, that provides you with some endpoints, more or less, that, pro that performs the uh, authentication protocol interactions. And um, why I'm showing you this is the thing that if you want to extend Keycloak in a way, then this is your stack, right? Um, of course, you can also add your own libraries and own your own frameworks there, but uh, that can be a little bit uh, difficult, but it's doable. But if you want to have an easy life, then if you work with that, what Keycloak provides out of the box, then everything is fine. Okay. <clears throat> if we now look, have, have a brief look at what Keycloak actually contains from uh, a component perspective, from an architecture perspective, you would see something like uh, a set of protocol endpoints that uh, manage those uh, single sign-on protocol uh, interactions. Then you have uh, components that uh, are... are, are um, used for the account management and login facilities, as well as the um, Realm administration itself. Everything that I configured through the Realm administration can be um, accessed via REST API, right? And the funny thing is, uh, you can also have a Java client for that so that you can programmatically configure your Realm via Java API, and there are also some command line interfaces as well. Um, besides that, Keycloak provides you with an event mechanism that you can then uh, hook into to get notified about user logins, user login errors, new user registrations, user profile updates, and so forth. And as said, there are many, many more uh, ways to get a user in, but uh, I won't cover it. Now, the thing is, uh, one Keycloak instance uh, stays not long alone for, for a while, because most of the time you want to have a High high, highly available setup of Keycloak. And uh, for that, you usually use multiple instances of Keycloak that are somehow um, connected to each other and form some kind of cluster. Um, and for this, uh, they use uh, InfiniSpan to do some kind of replication for uh, single sign-on session information, which is held in memory in Keycloak, um, such that if one instance dies, all the other instances still have the information that a certain user locked on, and therefore uh, he's, he is still locked in. So that's actually the thing. So now let's have a brief look at how Singleton on works with Keycloak. So what, what Singleton on is, we already learned uh, yesterday, but to summarize it, it effectively enables us to log in once, and then after that have access to all the applications that are secured by Keycloak. Keycloak uses some standardized protocols, as I already mentioned, which are OpenID Connect and uh, SAML, which is a very uh, major standard for, uh, that is uh, often found in big old enterprise software products, but nevertheless, it's very robust and works quite well. And what Keycloak basically provides you with is a so-called browser-based web SSO. So effectively, there's more or less always a browser involved. And, uh, but this doesn't mean that this only works for web applications. But this, it's, all, uh, it's possible to use it for mobile and desktop apps as well, right? And um, what another nice feature that keeps you, Keycloak gives you with uh, single on is also support for single lockout or global lockout, such that you can press a lockout button in one application, and this lockout gets then propagated to all your applic connected applications, and then you are locked out there as well. Of course, applications can opt in and decide whether they want to do, uh, um, uh, accept the lockout or not, um, but that's your choice and how you want to deal with this. Right, so now we have a practical example. Uh, this user here wants to access this app one, which is protected by Keycloak, and he is currently not authenticated. 
and you will use this browser to access the app. Every uh, arrow that goes to the browser will then uh, lead some interaction in the to some interaction in the browser. Every other arrow that goes outside the tri triangle uh, is then communication via a separate channel. So let's get started. So our unauthenticated user wants to access the app one. The app one in the turn now detects that the user is not authenticated yet and redirects the user to Keyclock for login. It will uh, add his, his own URL to the uh, redirect URI parameter. Geeklook shows the login page to the user, and the user will then submit his or her credentials to uh, Keyclock, and Keyclock will then validate those credentials. If those credentials are OK, then Keyclook creates a single sign on session and emits cookies for the ssr.ecb.io domain in this example. So Keyclook considers the user now as logged in. Then Keyclock will generate a random code and send this uh, via a redirect URI parameter um, back to the application one via the browser. Um, the application one then receives the code and uses a separate channel to communicate back to, to Keyclock to exchange the code for a set of tokens. Right? Keyclock, it asks Keyclock, well, have you seen an authentication recently that used this, co this code? Keyclock then looks this code up and says, well, yeah, I've seen that, so I can generate tokens and reply with a triplet of tokens in our case, uh, which will contain an access token, a refresh token, and an ID token. Um, the app now receives those tokens and will verify the received tokens. And if the, the signature of the tokens uh, are good, and then they, uh, this information can then be extracted and added to the, some kind of session. But sessions are not a requirement here. You could also store this information in cookies for the app.acme.io domain. It's just uh, for the sake of the example. Now app one can consider the user to be logged in. Um, so. That's the basic flow, and what we now just saw is the OpenID connect with the OAuth2 authorization code flow, just as we have seen in some other talks before. So, but what are the Keyclock tokens uh, about that I just mentioned? Well, also nothing new. Those tokens are just plain uh, OAuth and op OpenID connect tokens, which are effectively self-signed, self-contained JSON web token um, that contain some claims uh, as in form of key value pairs, which effectively are user information with some additional metadata. Um, those tokens are issued by Keyclock and signed with the real private key that are stored for the key, particular Keyclock realm. This means that those tokens can also very, be verified with a public key that is publicly accessible by your client applications. Those tokens have usually a limited lifespan, and uh, some of them can be revoked so that they can't be reused to get new tokens, for instance. Keyclock knows four essential token types, which uh, one of the important ones, of course, is the access token, which is known from the from OAuth 2 standard, which is usually a short-lived token that is used for accessing resources. Then you have a refresh token, which is often much longer-lived, even in a matter of day, uh, hours or days, um, that can be used to request new access tokens and other informations. And uh, we have the ID token, which uh, comes from the OpenID Connect standard and provides us with some additional user interf information, as we will see in a bit. Keyclock also provides a special fourth token type, which is called an offline token, um, which is a longer-lived uh, token type that uh, can be used for, um, in a matter of days or even weeks and months, that can be used to, uh, in, for instance, in scenarios where I just want to authenticate once, like a mobile app or something like that, that I can then store in a secure way on a mobile app and then use it to get new access tokens so that the user don't have to authenticate too often. Um, but those uh, tokens can, of course, also be revoked. So, I mean, nowadays, probably everyone is, many of you are familiar with JSON Web Tokens, so that I keep that brief. Um, JSON Web Tokens are basically uh, just uh, small strings that are consist composed of three components, like a header component, payload component, and signature component that are base64 encoded uh, JSON data structures. Uh, in this case, keep in mind that Base64 encoding does not mean any encryption, so you still have to make sure that all this JSON web token information is transferred via a secure channel, uh, otherwise you could leak information there. Um, yeah. Keyclock, as I said, also uses JSON web tokens, and I just want to quickly show how they look. Um, I have a token here prepared, so if I throw in this token, 
you would see some information like the uh, algorithm that was used to generate the token signature. You see a reference to the public key pair via this key ID parameter that's used to look up the public key later on to verify the signature. Here you see some information in the token, like the audience, what are the applications that can use this token in that case. Uh, you see a subject identifier, the user ID, which is effectively the user ID of the application, and some other information like the roles that are assigned to that particular user, which are contained in this token, or um, for, real, for the realm, or application-specific roles, as you can see here. Of course, there's also some user information in there, like uh, the username, the display name, email address, and whatever. Um, you can, of course, uh, customize the to information in the token to your uh, content, and uh, you can also add some additional user attributes there and the like, right? You are very flexible here. So, this is how those tokens look like. So, and now we have finally arrived as our final use case. Um, our user wants to access uh, data from a backend service that is guarded by some kind of application. And uh, uh, in this case, the user is already authenticated here, and he, wants, he still accesses the application with his um, um, browser. And this application then communicates with the backend services by using the access token that is provided to the user by the um, from session or from cookie information, what have you, um, this access token is then sent to the backend application, and then the backend application tries to verify this token first. It does that by trying to look up uh, appropriate public key first in a local cache, and if none is found, um, it will uh, go to Keycloak and uh, download the key and store it in the local cache. Um, key Keycloak will then send the, uh, the key back then the application, the backend, can use this key to verify the signature of the access token, and if everything is right, those inf it can actually work with the information from the token payload, and then um, yeah, can access the user's data and return those data to the, info to the app, that which can then display the data to the user, right? So the important thing is that there is still some communication required between the backend service and Keycloak um, in order to potentially download new public keys, especially if you did uh, applied key rotation, such that Keycloak um, yeah, needs to assign the access token potential with a new key that you then need to be able to dynamically access. So, uh, let's see. Now I want to secure my applications with Keycloak. And there I have some options, of course, um, like Keycloak provides out of the box a set of so-called adapters, which are more or less technology specific, many around uh, Java, but also for no are available for Node.js or plain JavaScript applications that uh, provide out of the box support for OpenID Connect and SAML, um, uh, which also already support the Keycloak specific information which are contained in the tokens, like the roles and permissions and so forth. Um, there are also other options like using reverse proxies like the Go-based Keycloak Gatekeeper project that effectively is a proxy more or less um, that, inject, that performs all the uh, protocol interaction and emits all the authentication information via HTTP headers to the downstream applications. And that's also possible uh, with this all other uh, modules for Apache, for instance, mod out OIDC or mod out Melon for SAML. Um, and there are many more options. Uh, besides that, there are also some generic integrations that you can use. You can f look at the slides later and to follow the links. Um, basically, everything that, that supports OpenID Connect or SAML2 uh, can be made to work with Keycloak, right? And uh, yeah, that's a pretty powerful characteristic. So now let's come, we come to the demo. Um, here we have an example for how we can secure apps with Keycloak in practice and how it looks and feels. Um, in our, my example setup, I have uh, four applications here, um, all with different uh, technologies um, that access um, a backend service uh, in the described manner. And if I now start my example environment, uh, I think I already prepared that stuff. Let me see. Just log in. Let me log in. Reload. Just. So if we go to my account page, this is basically the account page here. 
Uh, I don't know whether I already showed that to you. User can manage his profile, uh, profile here. He can manage his password, uh, which is also write, written back to Active Directory if configured. You can configure your own two-factor authentication, and of course, you get your list of applications. And uh, for instance, if I access my app here, uh, I'm all, now already authenticated, so that's why I was immediately redirected uh, to the actual app. And this app is just a front-end application that accesses some information from a back-end service uh, that I can just demonstrate. Uh, here I have a Postman, uh, where I access this uh, back-end service via, uh, um, yeah, via simple UI. And you see, if I try to access this, this back-end, uh, I get an unauthorized uh, error, so that means that I need to authenticate first in Postman. In order to do that, I just request a new token here, um, get an access token back, and use that token uh, to access the data from my to-do uh, backend. And this to-do backend effectively gives you a set of uh, yeah, to-do items um, that you can use. Oh, it's now gone. Oh, is that again? Nope. Oh, I followed the link. That's the reason why. Oh, head has gone. Don't mind. So that's the information that I see here. And in order to demonstrate the singleton on, I can also try to access other applications. And you see, I am immediately logged in. And if I now log out, uh, you see that I also immediately logged out in the other applications. Once I access them, we have some JavaScript magic and so forth. So that's the singleton on demonstrated here. If I do a reload here and access another app, a JavaScript-based uh, app that uses this information from the browser. Uh, you see some basic user information, some information that the token in the token that was received by the application, and so forth. Right? And I can also do a logout here, and you see it's al al almost instantly propagated to the other applications. So that's for the demo. How can you? You can find this here, by the way. You will see this, get the slides afterwards. This is uh, Thomas Darimond, my GitHub repository, Keyclock Docker demo. And uh, yeah, what did I need to configure to, to get that working? Well, it's, in this case, it's, I have multiple applications in that demo environment, so I will just show you one. Uh, this is, uh, if you use Java and uh, Spring Boot in that case, uh, the only thing you need to configure is uh, you say, okay, I want to use this particular Keyclock version, then Keyclock provides a specific uh, Spring Boot starter that provides all the authentication logic uh, and integration with the existing frameworks like Spring Security and Spring Boot. Um, you configure the uh, additional dependencies and uh, yeah, then you go to the config and specify mostly um, the the um, realm that you are using, the authors, auth server URL, um, the resource, which effectively means the client ID, your client secret, and what information should be propagated as a username. And with that, uh, you are almost set. Uh, then you have to implement a small um, Spring Security configuration snippet like that, that says which URLs you want to protect, and you use a Keyclock specific base class for the configuration. And that's basically it, right? And um, with that, you can yeah, access all the information from your um, authentication in your, when you process a request, and uh, this allows you to do work with the user data or uh, retrieve the access token that was used to access your service, and then you can either um, use that access token to, for downstream requests or uh, retrieve a new token for a new for a dedicated uh, client, uh, dedicated server call uh, for another service, and uh, there are many options that you can then apply. Okay, let's move on. Um, so that was how you can secure an application with Keycloak, um, but that's actually not everything that you need to do when you use Keycloak. But because usually, if you deploy Keycloak in your uh, infrastructure, you need some additional infrastructure to yeah, leverage the information that, to get the most out of Keycloak that pro it provides. So um, in our, my demo environment, I prepared some other things as well. Like, for instance, we have a, a load balancer here that works as a um, web application firewall and performs all the SSL termination. Um, and behind that, I have a small uh, Keycloak cluster uh, of three or more, uh, one or two nodes um, that um, effectively 
performs the session clustering, and uh, it also sends um, log data to in GALF uh, or JSON format to Greylog that I can then use for uh, log monitoring and alerts or some dashboards, as I will show you in a bit. And uh, I use Postgres to store the data there um, for Keycloak specific settings. But uh, I all, and I also use a message broker um, that is connected to Keycloak to capture uh, provisioning events like new user registrations or user profile updates and so forth. But uh, that's Apache uh, ActiveMQ is just an example. You could also use Kafka there and everything, something else. It's really quite pluggable. So let's see that in action. Uh, here I have the login page again, right? Um, and if I now log, look here at, at Greylog, I should see um, some login events. I logged in. Log out, and the login event should be here in a second. Here we are. And as you're probably used to from other tools like Elk, Kibana, um, or uh, Splunk and the like, you get some uh, nice uh, yeah, uh, log, uh, structured log information like what was the user, uh, who did the login, when, and so forth. Um, you can also use that uh, to create some nice dashboards like um, show me the number of daily logins and logouts and maybe login errors, which is also an interesting metric, uh, especially if you just rolled out a new version. Uh, you uh, are very keen to look at the error rate and how it develops, um, and you, once you see that it goes beyond a certain threshold, you can then probably roll back your change and so forth, right? And that is everything provided of the box. I have all this demo environment available on GitHub with all the complete setup as a Docker Compose infrastructure, so you can roll out that uh, to your own infrastructure as you like. Yeah, that was basically it from that point. Let me see further. Okay, that's what as it is looked. Ah, the last thing that I want to show, right, uh, is the propagation of account changes. Uh, here I see um, I have the first name Theo, right? And um, if I now switch to the um, message broker, here I have a, uh, set up a simple queue in that case that listens for change events in user profiles. So if I change the name like this, do a reload, then I get a nice uh, JSON document here that tells me, oh, there was a user profile update uh, performed by the user itself. Could have, could have also been an, an impersonated user or someone or an admin, and uh, I get a snapshot of the actual user profile as it looks currently in Keycloak, huh? such that um, I can then propagate it to other systems as, as required. Like, for instance, propagate name or address changes to a billing or CRM application and the like. Right? You can imagine what what's possible there. Okay, log out again. Okay. That's basically it for the demo. So with that said, I can conclude that I can, uh, e Kicklook is quite easy to get started. As said, you just, in, a, in the easiest case, you just unzip the download the distri distribution, unzip it, start it, and you have immediately a, a working Kicklook environment that you can use and play with. There are also some uh, in useful Docker images provided uh, that provides a few configuration options that enables you to get going quite fast. Um, yeah, besides that, uh, I hope I sh could show you that Kiko provides many features out of the box, like uh, singles and on social login, user federation support, and a decent user management. And uh, yeah, as I said, Kiko builds on proven and robust standards, like the set of authentication protocols that we just saw. And uh, yeah, it's very flexible in what you can do with it. And it's also easy to integrate into, into your own infrastructure and applications because of the many uh, out of the box adapters that are provided and uh, makes it quite easy to work with. And to conclude, I can say that uh, uh, Kiklo can be an important part for modern identity management that you can host yourself uh, on premise or in the cloud as you desire. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So uh, thanks for your attention and I think I now have some time for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, some questions? Okay. So, thanks for your talk. And you said that there is logout functionality, yeah. but uh, at the same time you said that uh, when token goes to some service, 
Yeah. Then service will check public key or uh, yeah. lazily grab it from uh, the SSO provider. Yeah. But how does the logout, logout works here? The, the, the logout works um, in that case where you have a session information or a cookie issued by an application. And the logout uh, is effectively a keycloak specific way. Um, so uh, the lo when you log out and perform a global logout, then keycloak basically sends a post HTTP post request uh, with some additional metadata like this was the session ID and this was the user. Right, that locked out, and this is then propagated to your application, and the application then needs to do something about it, right? Like invalidate the sessions which are associated with it, or uh, have a list of uh, I sessions that are timed out and use that for checks when the access token comes in with a request from a locked out user, right? That's one way to do it, but um, yeah, usually it, that's uh, not done at every level, right? So only at the front end layers, so to speak, where your initial requests come in, um, and not for the downstream requests. That, therefore, you usually set the uh, lifetimes of the access tokens to a quite low value, like one minute or five minute, minutes. But uh, Kiklook also supports to do that uh, in a client-specific manner, so you can also say, okay, for this particular interaction, I need some more time, like 15 minutes or so, and if a token is requested for that particular client, then it's even it's longer lived. Mm -hmm. yeah? Thank That's, you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for the demo one more time. Can you please open a slide with an encrypted token? Uh, this okay, an example, like this? Yeah, there should be section with uh, roles. Pardon? Uh, there should be section with roles in roles, the yeah, yeah, message yeah. in the payload. Right. Uh, this yeah. is not encrypted, right? That's just encoded. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so, okay. And, and signed. Yeah, sorry, my, okay. my fault. Uh, but for applications, this roles it seems to be a bit higher abstraction that it need to know. Uh -huh. Because most likely when you build an application, you should know uh, permissions, or in, in case of key clock, it's called uh, scopes. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's another mechanism that you can use. The key clock started with this role infrastructure, so just... Yeah. Yeah, how I can convert, if, so if I'm writing an application and someone else managing key clock, how I can convert roles into real scopes? Uh, well, the thing is, on the other hand, you can di work directly with scopes in key clock. But for the sake of the example, I just used roles. I could have also used just plain scopes here, like uh, a client could also configure a set of scopes that he wants to use, right? And then I can, associate, can send scopes with my token, so to speak, right? In addition to maybe roles. But a lot of traditional applications already have a role-based access control in place, and they have role structured, right? And so they're, they're, that's the reason why they added this model to uh, uh, as so prominently, so to speak, uh, because it works well with a lot of existing applications. More modern application, of course, could use this more uh, coarse-grained coarse uh, scopes mechanisms, right? Um, uh, to form a, some kind of abstraction, as you describe it, um, um, in order to express uh, access, so to speak, right? Yeah, so we need just add one more mapper, uh, and that's it, to get a list of scopes in the token. Yeah, 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 that's it. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, other questions? Hi, um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I especially like the part with the practical experience. I have two questions to that. Okay. So you talked about realms that they are like tenants. Um, right. When you deploy um, Keycloak in the field, how do you um, configure the realms? Can you give us some practical guidance? Uh, that, that's like a big topic. It really depends yeah. on the requirements. So are you looking for something specific? or I would just be interested in your experience from your uh, Maybe you like, can give like two or three examples. Like, let's say uh, many companies have, for instance, some sub-companies or sub-branches uh, that uh, provides uh, uh, specific services that not overlap with other services or that they have a certain look and feel. Um, then they, you would uh, usually create a dedicated realm for those sub-companies, so to speak, or branches or offerings, right? Because one thing that you have to keep in mind, um, Kiklo provides these theming mechanisms for the login and accounts pages and the emails that Kiklo sends for forgot password and the like. And those themes are specific to a realm, right? right? So if you want to have one look and feel for a set of applications, then you would also have to create a realm for that. But uh, one nice feature that Kiklo added recently was to be able to configure um, client-specific, where is it? Client-specific 
uh, themes. Where is it? Here. Ah, lock-in theme. Okay. Which is quite nice because uh, often you have the situations, if, especially if you consolidate a set of legacy applications where the users are used to have a certain look and feel for the login page, right? But we want to use Keyclook underneath, um, and now they are a little bit uh, irritated because, okay, they see now a different login screen and ask, wonder whether this is the right application. So with the, for that, you can configure uh, this particular application to use the old login theme, but use quick click underneath, which is quite a neat feature. And would you also use realms to distinguish between environments like testing, production, and so uh, I, That's one possibility, but I would not recommend that. I would rather recommend dedicated Keyclock environments for that, okay. right? Like a Keyclock cluster or Keyclock one or two clustered Keyclock instances for dev, or, or just one for dev for testing, right? And one for, uh, then one for pre-production or, or cluster for pre-production and a dedicated prod, prod, prod cluster. Okay, and my last question. Okay. So you introduced the concept of application. Let's assume we have a, a company with 200 microservices. Would each microservice be an application or how would you not, distinguish that? Not necessarily. Um, at least the, the uh, front-end facing applications would be a dedicated client. Back-end services don't necessarily need to be an explicit client here. I mean, Keyclook provides an abstraction for that as well, which is called uh, Barra only, right? But that's, uh, as I heard from the Keyclook developers, developers uh, subject to change. So, um, because, as said, in order to verify the token that is received by a microservice, you only need to access the public key to verify the signature, right? And so, there's actually no need to represent a, to a microservice explicitly as a client, but it could be possible that you have explicit roles, want to be able to configure explicit roles for that uh, client. So in that case, uh, it makes sense to have an re explicit representation of that client as an, or that application or service as a client in Keyclock, right? In order to be able to assign roles and work with them, right? So, okay. I think if we have, don't have further questions, if you have additional questions, just uh, grab me in the hallway. Um, we can t I'd love to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I have many, many, many additional demos that I wanted to show, but we have only a short amount of time. And yeah, so if you're interested, just ping me and we can get to talk. Thanks. <laughs>